Yeah, hello everybody and welcome to this uh, first webinar in a series of webinars on reinforcement learning and finance. So you might be aware of the fact that we recently started this uh, community effort called Quantset Dev, uh, which is targeted primarily towards quant developers. Uh, whatever this might entail in practice, right, the quant developer can be found in different functions, departments, companies around the globe. So primarily, obviously, in the financial domain, this is where these terms are used uh, intensively. But even if you are uh, interested in the field only, I think you can also learn a lot on our Discord server, more on that later on, as well as doing the webinars, the exchanges, uh, and all the other activities that we plan for this year and the uh, coming ones. I mean, I'm the founder uh, and CEO of the Air Machine, as well as the Python Quant, and I'm also the initiator of the uh, Quant at Dev uh, group. Yeah, uh, let me dive already into our topic of today. Um, uh, it is based primarily on code that you find in my book, Artificial Intelligence and Finance. And the topic itself was um, mainly chosen due to the fact that in the Discord group, there was kind of like a, an uh, intensive discussion about reinforcement learning, the benefits, the drawbacks, the problems of applying it to finance. So uh, I'm not promising the final solution to all the questions or problems that you might face, uh, that you might have in practice. Uh, but I think we can cover the topic and then you can decide for yourselves because uh, I always provide like full code so that you uh, can use the code and, and, and replicate the things that I do for yourself and maybe adjust it, improve it, of course. That would, love to learn about your improvements and about your experiences. But uh, again, basically the code is, uh, um, in particular at the beginning from uh, AI and finance, I'm planning to show a bit more than what was possible to include in AI and finance. And also I've uh, come up with some new stuff uh, afterwards. So I've shown, shown here, or put in here also my other book, Python for Algo Trading, because um, in the group and what I do, the primary goal of using reinforcement learning and Q learning in particular uh, applied to finance is usually trading, right? That you have something like a trading bot, an agent in the end, um, that it can let loose and that uh, is first trained and then uh, is uh, active on its own in the markets, right? So this is, uh, I think, what every finance uh, practitioner, student, academic is dreaming of to come up with such a bot. So how far we come, we'll uh, see. So here are now the links I've shared in the, um, uh, in the chat already, the, the link to the slides. So there are basically three things at this stage. There is a GitHub repo, which I've just created last minute. Um, the uh, repo contains the resources as they are currently stand, and I'm planning to use them. Uh, and as we go, I will add to the repo, I will update that, maybe um, uh, you star fork it uh, so that you have the latest uh, versions. Then you see in the middle here, the Discord server um, might be a little bit uh, involved to type these uh, characters, but if you have access to the slide deck, you can, um, yeah, and of course, just click on the link. You can also follow on Twitter. This is also something that we just started recently. There's not that much yet, but I'm planning to do quite a bit more. Um, I said it before, we have uh, a chat channel in Discord, and I would ask you to post your questions and comments in that chat channel, uh, because this then remains in yeah, your own, yeah, on the Discord server, and it documents a little bit the discussion. Um, so that we can later on follow up maybe on different questions that might have been answered, might not have been answered, stay open, or maybe we can also uh, document ideas there of what to do next in this context. So Discord server um, for today, please use the chat channel there. So reinforcement learning success stories. So, I'm pretty sure everybody is aware of the major success stories, but uh, just as a background for those who might be new in this field, uh, there is uh, what many people call the Bible of Reinforcement Learning uh, by Sutton Bartle. Uh, this book here, Reinforcement Learning Introduction, um, yeah, it's, I think, uh, a fantastic read. Um, you find there many, many background uh, information uh, pieces of the to reinforcement learning, how it developed over time, what the different uh, approaches are, but in particular, what is of interest for us, therefore I put it here last, it's Q learning and deep Q learning in particular. So I can only recommend this book. You find also electronic versions, uh, free electronic versions of this book 
on the web. If you are more interested in like kind of the, the success stories um, <laughs> on a high level, uh, this is kind of like an easy uh, read, maybe uh, before you go to bed, before you fall asleep. Uh, I have listened to it also as an audiobook. Uh, it's pretty interesting um, to learn how uh, the single success story started and, and what problems they faced, the teams, uh, where they tackled different problems like self driving cars in the beginning, recommender engines, uh, playing Atari games, and all these stories um, up to or down to the uh, playing the game of Go, which has even been documented in a Netflix documentary, which is also available on YouTube. So playing Atari games, I used to play these games like hell when I was young. So this was fantastic um, that we in our living rooms could get started playing these games uh, long, long before the powerful machines that we today have available when we speak of deep Q learning, right? Implement maybe with a TensorFlow or whatnot. Uh, here is the paper. Again, I don't want to go into the details here. This is more like a reference for you. If you're interested, you can look it up. So for me, this was kind of like the relationship, even more so than uh, I would say go. Uh, I never played Go in my life, although I find this exciting. Uh, I played chess quite a bit, not well. I was more fascinated by the computational side, actually. Um, always, so this is fantastic. But playing Atari games, this was for me like the kick. I said, well, really, there is kind of like an agent who can play Atari games better than a human being. This was for me uh, when I was convinced there must be something uh, to it. So Go and AlphaGo, right? For me, this was one of the first books that I read. Uh, super intelligence or artificial general intelligence and I just want to emphasize here in 2014 one of the leading uh, researchers in the field I mean Bostrom uh, predicted that it might take um, another 10 years right a decade until game of Go can be cracked by AI because it is so inherently complex yeah it took like uh, one year longer until the European champion was beaten and in January um, 2016. Um, the world champion was beaten. So we see here tremendous progress um, in terms of like uh, hardware usage, like by Google here with the TPUs instead of GPUs, uh, also the improvement of the algorithms uh, and the, and the self uh, reinforcement learning during the training cycle. So fantastic stories. You should read it if you haven't done so. Uh, with chess, uh, this was cracked before. Chess is not as complex overall as Go. And with a 10 million uh, supercomputer named Deep Blue, um, IBM was able to beat Kasparov already at the end of the uh, 1997s. But this has had hardly anything to do with AI. It was rather a brute force hardware game. And when you then have a look at Alpha Zero, uh, which is able to play against itself, and this is already a bit older, um, for nine hours, and is better than any human being on Earth in playing chess, and better than any machine that has ever been built or devised. Like, uh, all these chess engines that have been growing over decades, basically, uh, it is really fantastic. So there's no wonder that everybody, not only people in finance, are um, eager to try at least to apply uh, reinforcement learning, Q learning, and some uh, agent methods um, out of the field to other domains. Like, of course, in finance, we all know if you have a breakthrough there, this can mean uh, immediately. Uh, great riches that you can make in the market, so I'm thinking in terms of training. So coming already to the basic notions, uh, of course, I have prepared code, uh, but I think it's good to have some yeah, basic idea of what is going on there. And this is a framework which we will use, or what yeah, the basic notions are things that we will uh, encounter over and over again during my uh, webinar series. Um, and yeah, let's get started. First, we have an environment. Um, that's uh, the major thing with which any type of agent, whatever the algorithm is in the end, interacts, right? There's a problem at hand. So this can be a computer game. We have seen Atari, or it can be a financial market. Then we have the state of a computer game. This can be represented by pixels on the screen, or it can be represented by additional features, or additional uh, data points. Um, Right, so that's uh, the thing. In financial markets, we might have, I don't know, a collection of data points which say, well, this is currently, this is uh, the current interest rate, this is uh, the current level of the S&P 500, whatever it might be that describes the, the state of the environment can be used in this context. We are going to keep it mostly pretty simple in this context. Then we have the agent, agent, well, it's not a person, it's more like an agent. Uh, Agent Smith in, in the matrix is a, it's a computer program, right? a computer program an algorithm, which is nevertheless able to act on its own, to interact with the environment. 
right? it learns from these interactions, updates the policy, and then hopefully improves playing the game, trading in the markets over time. Uh, speaking of the agent, usually, at least in our cases, most of the cases, we have a limited set of actions. Uh, let's say move the pedal to the left, move the pedal to the right, or in the markets go along or go short, or uh, reduce position or increase the position, um, right? Or exchange one asset for another might be another action. So we keep it simple here. Then we have a step. What is the step? Yeah, we move the environment forward step by step, right? So we have a state, we have a next state, and what happens in between is usually called a step. Um, the beauty here when we work with uh, software environments and not the real world um, with um, you know, wire APIs is that we can basically um, decide on the speed. So it's not like you know that um, we need to be as slow as in the real world or uh, maybe as fast as something is in the real world. We can be slower or faster. Right. So uh, the step simply says we have a state and we move from one state to the other. Right. And usually this only works forward. Right. Like in real life, time is ticking. Right. We cannot say, oh, well, this was a mistake. Let's go back. This is only possible that we say, well, we do a replay or whatever. And then we learn from our mistakes. Then we have a reward. Like a real life, if you do something good, at least when you're young at school, right, you get a, a reward. Or when you do something not as good or wrong, you might get a penalty. So the same holds true here. Uh, uh, the reward plays a major role in the updating of the optimal policy. And then we have a target for a computer game. Usually, it's uh, I really recall this well when I was young. We were playing like card games and some. Uh, pubs back then, uh, young, young people could go alone uh, to pubs and we tried to crack the high score. The high score, this might be a target in a computer game. For financial trading, this might be uh, the trading profit, right? p and uh, whatever, or a average return or whatever you have as a financial um, benchmark yardstick that you consider um, appropriate. Of course, Reward and target must somehow uh, be related or closely related. Um, otherwise, uh, it wouldn't really work in this context. Then we have the policy. Strictly speaking, the policy is the, is the mind of the agent that simply says, when I see a state, I have a number of actions. And the policy says, given that state, given the possible actions, I choose action A, B, C. Um, depending on how many actions there are available. So this can be move right, move left, or trading bot uh, could say this is um, uh, I go long or I go short. An episode is a whole game, right? Back in the days when I was playing card games, I needed one Deutsche Mark to play one game. Uh, when my three lives were gone, uh, the episode was over. So it's like a whole sequence of um, steps, actually. Before we get to um q learning and um yeah in that sense one of the most popular and most successful um algorithms and reinforcement learning let's dive into the code and let's have a look at open ai gym because when you recall my title was from playing games to trading in the markets and now that i speak of code Right, I have the code here. I will basically execute this locally. Um, you see, there is uh, the book where most of the code uh, is from. Uh, there have been updates and adjustments, right? But the original uh, things are coming from the book. Here's also reference Q learning. So we come to that a little bit later. I want to get started here with Jim. And having said that, there is the um, repository. So I will execute this. Locally, you see there is some stuff that is basically not needed here. So I can also um, delete that um, because when there is no visualization, we don't need this. I will um, execute it locally, but you have access to the GitHub repo, right? So here is the gist, uh, not the gist, it's the readme. So I can also, again, for reference, share it. Um, in the and the chat to get 
people. So I put this in the Discord um, chat, right? And even if you don't want to install all the stuff that is required, basically it's not that much, at least in the beginning, um, right? You can use um, Colab. I recently got somehow a fan of Colab, um, basically um, out of being ignorant, unaware of all the nice features that, that Colab has. So if you go to, um, uh, I have already executed something here, so I, I'm going to close this and use the link. Use the link that I provide here. Um, it's a free tire. I don't have uh, currently any subscription, right? But here, the link that I share, I can also share that one. And the chat. Um, and when you open this link, you see this um, yeah, interactive prompt, and you need to just um, type in my um, username on GitHub, Y Hilfish, and then it now searches all the repos that are in my account. There are quite a few. So the first one, simply in alphabetical order, is AIIF. This is the code from the book, AI and Finance. There you'll find also, if you're interested, there you'll find also like on networks in here, chapter nine, AB, that's a longer chapter on reinforcement learning. You'll find also the um, Jupyter notebooks there, but I want, of course, as you see, I have quite a few. Um, where do we have it? It's, oh, bah, 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 bah. RL Finance such a long list <laughs> and in RL Finance in this current repo there are just two um, at this stage two um, Jupyter notebooks and when I click on the first one Colab opens it from the GitHub repo and then you should be able to execute that as well so that's kind of like pretty small uh, usually you get prompted um, with a kind of warning, this notebook was not authored by Google. I say run anyway. Right, and it might take a little bit until single things are executed. I I don't want to execute like everything in here. So then you can go step by step, and you see I now execute here the the green check marks show that the cell has been executed. You also see the outputs here. So. Actually, pretty convenient uh, from the repo. Um, you can wire call up uh, with the link that I've provided, open immediately such a notebook. And I checked uh, the two of them that I'm going to use today. They should uh, work out of the box. If you change things, make sure that you uh, put them in uh, Google Drive or whatever. <laughs> but whatever they offer as an option, otherwise you would lose on call up uh, your um, changes. So we have learned about the uh, basics, the basic notions, and I now want to illustrate the basic notions here based on yeah, the so famous card pool environment. Um, let me see if I find a... V1, let me check. I work with V0, V1 shouldn't make a big difference, so I'm looking up it here. And here you see it, this is what I was looking for. I have also a couple of notebooks used in the past where I had this visualization included in the notebook, but yeah, Jupyter Notebook is not really uh, the best environment to do some um, visualizations like these. And you see, um, couple is very simple. You have the card with the position, and you have uh, the, the card speed, and you have uh, then the poll on top of that. And the goal of the game, probably I've seen this, you've heard of it, maybe you've worked with it, um, is to balance the poll so that it doesn't fall over. Right? I think 15 degrees or whatnot is the limit when it falls over, and you lose this game. If you are able to survive 200 steps going forward one by one, then this is considered to be a success. It's not infinite. 200, they say, is success. You have, quote unquote, cracked the game. And there is another rule um, over 100 consecutive games. The agent shall have an average of 195 points, which means 195 steps on average survived, at least in order to be considered a successful agent. 
it's one game and then there's uh, the additional one. So that's the um, the um, card to open AI gym environment. How does this look like? Right? Well, we are well, we would be playing a game as human beings, probably would have like a joystick or whatever and try to balance it, but this is not how reinforcement learning works. Uh, let's see how it works on the API level. So I import Jim the environment, then the um, creation, the instantiation of an object, of such an object. I set a seed so that it's reproducible, right? And basically two seeds for the action space and the environment itself. And then I can, for example, inspect for the observation space. And we see the observation space has um, just four elements, right? I can observe uh, potential values. I can also check here the low values, the lowest values. And you see this can be um, minus infinity in two cases. Or, and here, low values minus 4.8 for the environment allowed and minus 0 0.41. I can also check for the high values. I'm just showing this, that this is all available here. Uh, for the implementations afterwards, this doesn't play a role for us. But in some circumstances, or depending on the algorithm that you use, this might be important um, to know. So how can we now work and, and, and interact with the environment and step the environment forward? So the first thing that we usually do is we reset the environment. Right? Then we have a state, and this is um, with some randomness, um, I have here set a seed, right? So that when I go through the sequence of code, um, this should always be the same. But when I repeat this without setting the seed again, I get another initial state because the initial state has already some randomness. So it's not completely random. So we get something where the pole is upright. Uh, oh, this is uh, now we see. A little bit later or what this all represents um, we see a little bit later uh, but we need to recognize here it starts usually from a different um, initial state so the initial state changes um, all the time in those cases where we do not fix the seed the action space is just two we have two options two actions that we can take right and we can randomly sample from the action space so uh, this is to get started with, you know, we don't have any agent yet who has any type of intelligence or insight into this um, a problem here. We might have the need uh, for random sampling. We say, well, let's play this game randomly, more like rolling uh, the dice in this uh, context, right? Sample, you see, by chance, I get here uh, one, uh, zero. I can repeat this, of course, a bunch of times, and I get zeros and ones. Let's now pick one arbitrarily, meaning randomly, one, right? And what I do now is um, I step, and maybe this is not even here <laughs> so pronounced, I step the environment from the initial state to the next state by taking action A. This is chosen randomly, no intelligence whatsoever. And I get back four different objects. State, we have four parameters. One is the reward, so I get plus one, plus one, plus one. It's just like here it represents success, right? Plus one and done simply indicates whether I'm still in the game. So whenever we see there uh, true, this means we have reached the very end, 200, or we have failed on the way. So false at this stage is pretty good because we are not yet done with it. So what uh, are these um, um, numbers now about? This is a pretty uh, uh, simple thing I said before that maybe um, we uh, have a game and the state of the game is represented by pixels on the screen, right? Um, but here it is different. So we have a physical simplification of it. We have the card position, the card velocity. We have the, um, the uh, angle of the pole plus the angular velocity of the pole. So it's not about pixels here in this context, right? It's just about 
four physical parameters. Position of the card, velocity of the card, the um, angle of the pole, and the angular velocity. So how fast is this dropping to the left or to the right? But in an ideal world, uh, maybe uh, somebody who has trained this for, I don't know, uh, 15 years uh, to uh, perform in a, in a circus, right? Uh, they have it completely um, straight up and only minuscule um, movements. Uh, but here you see this is really hectic. So what they show here is pretty hectic. Uh, and yeah, going left, right, left, right, the angle changes, angular velocity changes. And this is what these four numbers are about position. And overall, we don't really care um, in such a context what does 0 0.0378 stands for. Slightly right to the middle, I would say. Right? But in the end, the agent doesn't have any clue, this is what we always need to internalize and remember, doesn't have a clue what these four numbers are about. So the, the agent of our program takes four numbers as input, whatever they are, and then takes actions and see how the state changes um, after taking the action. This is recorded um, and the agent then updates the policy given the reward that it receives or no reward maybe, or sometimes a penalty. Um, so um, it's not like that the, uh, the, the AI agent, the RL agent needs any kind of visual representation, not even an explanation for what this are, right? Uh, the agent won't need any physical model maybe um, yeah, to, to write down some uh, differential equations in order to um, predict what's happening when action A or B is taken. This works differently and, and this is one of the, the beauty things. So let's simply do a, a quick run. A quick run in the sense of we only a sample here, so randomly sample some actions. And you see in this particular run, after step 14, um, we fail because there must be some uh, true here returned for done, so we are finished. But we are not successful in this context because again, 200 steps is considered successful. Right, so we failed here. This is what it says. Sometimes randomness um, is a bit better. So instead of 14, uh, 27, and we can repeat this exercise a couple of times. So it's not that we fail immediately when we only go with random stuff, um, but usually it's kind of early and we can conclude it's far away from uh, 200. So in order to um, solve the problem we don't really need for this particular um, environment a problem we don't really need um, q learning deep q learning or whatever there are other algorithms and this is one that i first saw on um, this uh, web page and the idea is to reduce dimensionality and that's the reason why i like to use and show this example because this is something that is I think inherent in many, many machine learning, deep learning, and here we also see it uh, later on in the reinforcement learning environment. Uh, we have something as complex as a physical problem here. It's a card, it's a, uh, a pole on the card. Uh, we have the speed of the card, we have the, the pole angle, et cetera, right? You see it visually represented, but this whole thing here is just boiled down to four physical parameters. This is already dimensionality reductions. If you would like to have all the pixels here of this game, this would of course give us more and more features that we would need to work with. But I want to go now one step further and further reduce dimensionality. Um, I fix now the seed for NP, uh, for NumPy, and I come up with some random weights. Why weights? Yeah, because the um, um, the idea here is based on taking a product between two vectors. So how does it work? We have a now new initial state which is fixed by the seeds. Uh, sorry, not I haven't fixed the seed of the environment, so this uh, doesn't fix it here. But when you go from the first cell to the last, um, then you will always get the same results. 
and I take the dot product between the state and the weights. And this gives me now a single number. So physical world, pictures, pixels, four physical parameters, dot product, now a single parameter only. So this is a further reduction of dimensionality. And the action rule now is uh, conditioned on the um, is conditioned on this single value that we have here, right? Um, and how does it look? The idea is that we um, take action zero, move the whole thing to the left, or push it to the left, right? Card, right? We have the idea of pushing it. Um, if S is negative, otherwise A equals one, we push it in the other direction. By we, I mean here, of course, the agent, right? We are not interacting. Uh, we are not doing something manually. We want to have the software solving all the problems here. So in that sense, for the number that we see here, right? It's positive, other ergo, we get here a one. I might try to come up with uh, something else. Now we see the S value for the single state, S for state, it's just one number, we now get a zero. So the question is, does it work or not? Let's give it a try. I have now a function, a Python function, which takes the environment as an input and the weights. And with the weights, we now implement the whole uh, episode here right and have what i've done here just once repeated as long as we are not done right when we get back done that's then it's over right and uh, we can now use the weights and we get to 61 95 86 126 so this is all all these numbers it's a little bit of luck here, um, by chance, are now larger than what you have seen before, where I was just randomly sampling the whole thing. But we now want to improve the whole story by saying, well, we have chosen the weights completely randomly, out of the blue, right? Who says that these are good weights? Uh, we could have gotten completely different weights. Maybe they would have been better or much worse. Who knows? So therefore, now by simple learning, where I fix the seeds now. And I want to do a maximum of a thousand episodes, usually it's in the low two digits, uh, set the seeds. Um, what I want to do, I want to iterate as long as I have uh, here not a successful set of weights discovered. And this is more like Monte Carlo simulation. So we repeat, repeat, repeat. We draw random weights and we apply the uh, the approach from before and when we are getting to uh, 200 then we say it's a success when we are better than the previous result we at least update and store the weights so simple learning but it's brute force there's no intelligence no representation it's random 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 and we simply check what is good in our case and you see here it's already after 13 episodes um 13 games that we get these weights so maybe let's, um, uh, here I set the seeds, maybe I repeat the exercise. Um, here it's already after nine, so you see this is going pretty fast. Um, nine, <laughs> already after six, after seven, sorry. So it doesn't take that long, and that's a little bit surprising, right? Here it's now 20, right? That we get weights that obviously with our rule, the algorithm give us um, yeah, a good chance of being successful with the game. So speaking of that, let's do the litmus test here, a hundred runs, and then we um, calculate the average. I said above 195 is considered to be a successful agent. Ah, here you see, that's not a good one, right? I, not a, I mean, it's good, but it's not considered successful because the average, as we would see, is well below 195. I think I have with the seed, I have with the seed value, I get something that is uh, perfect. But you can play around. You see already here the first 10 are 200, 200, 200, right? And I get here a perfect result with these weights. 
So there's no guarantee that uh, the weights that I have found here, um, even if they have shown once completely successful episode, uh, will be always successful, right? Recall we have some randomness in the initial state, and that's uh, now reflected or has been reflected before. Uh, here it's now a perfect agent. You can also go, I don't know, to a thousand if you don't trust that it's still um, it's still uh, 200. Yeah, so we have the environment, we have the idea, the concept of dimensionality reduction. Um, we have now used brute force Monte Carlo simulation to come up with weights in combination with a decision rule, with an action rule, right? And we see uh, this is already good enough to um, solve the problem here. So in other words, I don't need necessarily um, um, I don't need necessarily here um, uh, um, yeah, a deep Q learning agent, whatnot, right, in order to solve this. Yeah, there's a question with regard to a, a trading related example. We come to trading, but we need to have the, the, um, the basics first. So finance and, and trading and trading bots uh, we will cover in the series a little bit later. Without the, without the, the basics, it's pretty difficult. Uh, to see how we uh, best apply reinforcement learning and queue learning to a finance environment. So later on, just a little bit of an outlook, we will develop finance or show we develop finance environments um, that behave more or less in the way like the open AI gym environments where we can use the queue learning agents and let the queue learning agents interact with the finance environment. But at this stage, open AI gym doesn't simply have a financial market environment, I don't know, the US stock market or whatnot, this is uh, not available. Uh, but I will share code, uh, which is, does exactly the trick with regard to trading, going long and short, uh, etc. right? So uh, for these more evolved problems and also for other um, open AI uh, gym environments, we need a bit more than just some random weights uh, drawing, right? And um, yeah, a simple decision rule, we need probably something that is called Q-learning. Um, when we talk about training in financial markets and speaking of a, a reinforcement learning agent, usually what is meant here is Q-learning, uh, and in particular, deep Q-learning. In this context, we will work with a reward function. Um, um, R that assigns to each state action pair a numerical reward. So we have seen this already. I have a state, the agent takes an action based on a policy, based uh, randomly, and the reward is received. In the simple case of card pool, it can only be a one. So I get, if I'm successful, I get one, one, another one, another one. But this is not necessarily in other cases as well. Then we have the action policy. Um, which is uh, similar, but uh, a little bit more uh, involved. Also looking into the future, a policy queue assigns to each state and allowed action, uh, same, we start with the same starting points, a numerical value. So how is the numerical value um, composed? It is composed of the immediate reward, here we go, immediate reward, plus the discount of the late reward. And that's kind of like the major thing in uh, uh, Q-learning, um, it's not only what I get currently, but also what I get later on. This is, I mean, everybody knows this. Uh, when you play chess, for example, it's not kind of like that you just try to optimize for your next move. Uh, you think further forward, next move and the move there afterwards and the, the reactions of your opponent and uh, grandmasters are able, I don't know, to, to um, uh, simulate in their head uh, like seven, eight, nine moves, depending on how many pieces are on the board, right? So this is what we need to take into account. Not only our current move, but also what happens after. Also in real life, right? Uh, do I eat the Snickers or not? Uh, eating the Snickers gives me an immediate reward, but tomorrow when I go on the scale, I will have, I don't know, 250 grams on top of my previous weight. And here is the formula, which is important. We have the reward function plus Gamma is a discount, the discount of the next state's optimal um, uh, or reward based on the optimal action. So we maximize looking forward 
given our policy, so this you see this is related here, somewhat recursive, right? Um, so we have immediate reward plus discounted delayed reward. We see it in action later on. Then we have a representation, the policy queue. For a very simple case, think tic-tac-toe can be represented in a table. You have all the possible state action uh, pairs, and um, then you write simply down what is to do in this case, right? But um, think of, I don't know, Atari card games. Uh, that's not possible, right? We, we, cannot, we cannot write down everything, so we need some representation for Q. Um, and some approximation. And this is now where neural networks and where the deep and deep Q learning comes from, um, that we have uh, approximation capabilities uh, of neural networks that are fantastic, universal approximation theorems, and we use the deep neural networks to represent, to approximate the optimal policy. This is now where we don't forget about the deep learning. To the contrary, deep learning, deep neural networks are an essential feature of um, the environment. So here just a link to um, a paper and a statement with regard to a universal approximation. Then we have two types of actions. The one is a random one. We have seen this already. This is for exploration. So we need to interact fast, 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 randomly with the environment to get feedback, feedback, feedback. And the more we have learned, the more feedback we have gotten, um, maybe the more we rely on the at this point, current optimal policy and exploit this policy. So exploration simply means random action. Exploitation means an action given the um, optimal policy. Replay is used to retrain, to update the neural network. So we collect our experiences over time and we use sampled experiences to train, to retrain, to update the neural network. Gamma, I said it already, is the discount factor. Epsilon is the uh, ratio with which the algorithm relies on exploration as compared to exploitation or to all the actions uh, taken. Right? Epsilon decay, um, this is another parameter that we can choose. This means that probably we begin with epsilon 100% because in the beginning the neural network doesn't know anything with regards to the problem at hand. So we explore, explore, explore. And over time, when we have learned something, epsilon decay decreases the exploration and increases the exploitation. So we can, with epsilon decay, we can make this faster or um, slow, right? That is a, a pretty, pretty long-winded uh, question or a couple of questions. I think at this point, uh, with regard to trading bots, uh, where we are with the basics, it's uh, it's not that simple to say. And uh, some people even say, well, reinforcement learning for trading doesn't really work. It might work for position sizing. It works maybe for hatching uh, related trades, etc. Maybe we keep the discussion with regard to what works, what works not for a little bit later. And as usual, people who have maybe something that is successful uh, in production, they probably won't tell you anything in this regard. Uh, even machine learning in general, and then deep learning, and then reinforcement learning as a further subcategory um, are with regard to trading, trading execution, still a minor part of what's going on in the markets. So you hear like uh, stocks are traded algorithmically uh, to 80, 90% depending on the market that you look, yes, but they, uh, these are in general not uh, AI related, uh, machine learning related algorithms in this context, right? Um, so this is what we need to be aware of. This is still all pretty, pretty nascent. Yeah, but sticking to the basics at this point, we will have enough um, time to uh, discuss the pros and cons later on. Um, let's see how a um, simple Q learning agent might look. So there is yeah, a bunch of imports um, there. You know about the cardpool environment and I'm going to use TensorFlow Keras here. Um, this should also work with the link to Colab that I showed before. I mean, it's from Google. They have uh, TensorFlow versions installed. Let me check. I have here, I don't know, a little bit of an older version, but uh, the code now should work with, I don't know, up to 2.7 or whatnot. I'm not aware, uh, given the, the recent versions, this is what I have here on my uh, Mac M1 um, 
so by default installed um, and I guess the code that was changed previously should work with the newer versions as well. So importing TensorFlow, Keras, um, the single elements that we need, then dropout. Oh, I, I don't think I use dropout here. No, it's a simple, so even this here might not be uh, required, but it doesn't hurt. I set a number of seeds to make it as reproducible as possible. So Python random, NumPy random, uh, TensorFlow random, the environment uh, in general, the environment action space. So five seeds that I fix, and now we come to the queue learning. Uh, for the storage, um, saving of the um, experiences um, for the replay, I use that queue. This is basically a list object where you can specify how many elements are allowed and it works like a queue, right? Once you have reached 2000 and you add your append something, the very first element um, in the previous state is dropped, right? So you have a maximum, you see here, maximum length of 2000. Uh, for the deck users, that we don't have the old, old, old experiences that have been included already in the neural network. We just work with newer, more recent experiences, uh, reflecting that over time the agent will rely more on what is learned. So we simply forget. I mean, this is like when you when you start, I don't know, playing tennis or any other game. If you listen to this, and you probably won't recall your not so fantastic first matches, rather the ones when you are better and you want to learn and take it from there a little bit later on. So the DQL agent, let's have a look. Um, it looks long, but given all the notions that we have uh, discussed, it's, I think, with Python background, not too difficult to understand. So I'm not going into every single detail here, but you can work with the code, you have access to the code, you should go through it, maybe you change parameters. Uh, finish is just used here, so that I say I finish early, um, maybe um, depending on what the problem is. But every problem that we might face is like card pool, which simply ends at 200, right? Can be at, uh, can also run infinitely or whatnot, right? Um, epsilon exploration, we start with 100%. The lowest value should be 1%, and epsilon decay is 90. Uh, 9.5%. Gamma here is set to 95. That's the discount factor. The batch size is used in the replay. I collect averages here for the um, um, success rate. So to see how it improves, not game by game, episode by episode, but for the last 25. Thank you. I, oops, I explained it. I was executing the cell because it's so long. Um, drop down. Um, and here, the, this is just used for the building of the model, and here the model is split. This is a very simple uh, uh, deep neural network, nothing special. I have uh, one layer, a second hidden layer, and here we are already at the output layer, right? So it's, uh, it can be considered deep because we have two layers. It's not simple or shallow, but it's not, you see, by default with 24 hidden units. That's a pretty small um, Neural network. Then we have here the act method, right? We see whenever we draw a random number, which is, this is uniformly distributed between zero and one, whenever this value is below the current self epsilon, then we do exploration. Otherwise, we rely here on our optimal policy. Replay is to train, to retrain, to update the um, neural network, which represents Q, we call Q policy, hopefully optimal from a certain point on. And here we have the um, reward. The reward here is from my yeah, randomly sampled um, element in batch and reward plus equals. So gamma, this is now with the second expression in the um, in the optimal policy function comes um, to fruition, and then we update it and train the model here, basically experience by experience. So when you are used to more to deep learning models or standard uh, regression models, uh, classification models, you have I don't know five thousand um, rows, data rows um, with 10 features and 5,000 labels, right? You do it in one step. Here, 
reinforcement learning is kind of a, a pretty sequential exercise and this makes it uh, computationally hard. There are of course uh, mechanisms and techniques to parallelize stuff, but uh, the base algorithm here you see is implemented sequentially. Therefore, it takes quite a bit longer as compared to something else where you have like even a million data points and train like a classifier um, on a million uh, data points of features and labels uh, in a single step or in a single um, learn training run, right? Now the learning, without going into every detail, I have a number of episodes that I play. I reset the environment, um, get a state, then I take the action. I collect next state reward done info as before. There's a little bit of reshaping going on for um, yeah, appropriate shapes to be passed. And I append this to memory. Recall this is that queue, that's a queue. A maximum of 2,000 2, such list objects are collected there. Right? And when we are done, we do a couple of calculations here in this context. So meaning we um, um, get the number of uh, rewards, total number of rewards, then we calculate some average here over the last 25 episodes and we um, store the maximum rewards so that we see do we have some improvement at this stage or not, and we print out. Right? If the average is above 195, this was the finish uh, from before, and uh, here's the finish flag, then we stop. Right? This is like the rule that I have um, discussed before and have shown with a simple dimensionality reduction um, um, approach there. Right? So 195 is considered successful. Uh, finish is set to false here. Test is simply um, yeah, a helper method which allows me to test the optimal policy um, in the sense of that test completely relies on exploitation and there is no exploration going on. Um, I mean, this makes sense, right? After you have uh, trained, I don't know if you're playing soccer, football, for example, you go to the training, you do here and there, but once there is uh, the day, Saturday for competition, there is no exploration anymore. You simply do uh, the best you can, and this is what is simulated here. So let's say we would uh, have, or yeah, would go with the maximum of 500 episodes. Um, I set the seats again here. The DQL agent is instantiated with gamma 0.9. By default, I, I simply have changed here a couple of values. Uh, you can play around with different values. Um, discount factor 0.9, hidden units 20, finish true. I argumented, so whatever the average is above, at a certain point, is above 195, we finish early. And let's do it in straight. And we will see now, before this was all pretty fast, I didn't know, in the millisecond uh, range, now training will take time, right? 500 episodes, and you see it's now, it's going kind of fast, but still, it takes a bit. You see total reward is jumping up and down. In between, we've had a maximum of 200 already, and the average, um, yeah goes up and down. Even, even It's not like that it's going linearly up or um, up overall, whether linear or not. So it's improving and it's getting worse. And maybe we check just to get a good uh, feel for it. Agent epsilon, because the numbers are varying that much, right? We still have 8% at this stage with that many um, that many episodes, we still have uh, epsilon of, uh, which means exploration, random sampling of 8%. Right? So how does it look with regard to um, the uh, average number? So this is um, the trend, this is the, the moving average of the successes, right? This is like uh, looking backwards, 25 episodes already here it was above 125, it goes back down. Up, down. You see, overall, the trend. I think this is a cubic regression, or what do I use? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I use a cubic regression here. Overall, it's getting better and better, right? You see here, the more training, the better. But this is like with Alpha Zero, nine hours of chess, uh, <laughs> probably. Uh, it's in uh, when Alpha Zero is trained for two hours, and then for three hours, we would expect the version 
three hours of training to be better than two. And once it's trained eight or nine hours, you want this to be much better than um, the version from two or three hours, right? So this is what we see here as well. Over time, we're getting better, but not perfect, right? It's not like that it goes like straight up here as the regression line would suggest. So the test now, let's see. Uh, this is still pretty jumping around here and we get an average of 139. So even with a deep Q learning edge, it's not that simple to crack um, here the card pool uh, problem. Uh, although we have now used a much, much more sophisticated approach, which is much more flexible than the one that we had before, because it can apply to many other uh, scenarios and environments, etc. For example, you could have something with eight inputs, eight features, instead of just four or whatever. Um, that's pretty flexible in this regard, right? Uh, but the whole work that we've done, the, the long, the many lines of code, uh, don't bring us uh, after 30 seconds uh, more um, yeah, better results, right? We can, of course, always put in more effort. So I now go here with uh, another run. Um, and this might help improving it. Right. Uh, but still, there is no guarantee, but we would expect it after a certain period of time that it's uh, then quite a bit better. You see now the average is uh, yeah, staying on a relatively high level. Uh, a little bit of luck is here involved as well. Let me see whether it works. Uh, I think we're just on time because it's the final thing that I wanted to show. Um, yeah, looking at the questions, there haven't been that many questions so far, like here with regard to the basics. Um, again, the discussion, how this works in finance, et cetera, we should uh, get back um, to something a bit later. Yeah, with regard to uh, the notebooks, or whether you get the notebooks, I've shared the, um, um, the, uh, the repo, sure. I don't know for when the question was with regard to notebook sharing. Oh, have a look at this here. Yeah, it started from scratch and uh, here it stopped kind of early. So let's see how this now works. And after some intensive retraining, right, uh, we now got a deep Q learning agent, which is uh, also perfect when it plays 100 games. Uh, but you saw this is like kind of a wall. We had like uh, 30 seconds and 44 seconds. So overall, this took like uh, a minute and 15 seconds, 75 seconds, uh, where we compared this, compared this with our simple approach here. This was all lightning fast, right? Pretty, pretty simple. Um, some dot product is, of course, easily calculated and, and random numbers are also drawn um, at, uh, for us, human beings at least, uh, it feels like the speed of light. Right, so this is um, pretty pretty fast, but deep Q learning, now we have the basics, the notions, how such a deep Q learning agent looks like. And one of the next steps will be to apply this now to a yeah, yet to be designed, yet to be introduced finance environment, which shall behave like the open engine environment. So this will be one of my approaches that I said, well, we have the DQL agent now, deep Q learning agent, this agent with enough training was able to yeah, play card pool perfectly. Um, can we use the same agent to attack a training problem? And I say yes, uh, but we need an appropriate finance environment. The, um, um, what, do I, what do I want to say? Um, yeah, this is a little bit in analogy to the Alpha Go story. Uh, it more or less had the major breakthroughs with AlphaGo, but later on they used the uh, yeah, the setup, the algorithms, etc., um, to crack chess as well. So when it was so good at playing Go, why not try it with chess? And here it's a little bit of the same idea that I want to follow to say, well, this is now able to play Carpool perfectly. Why don't we use it um, with another environment and try and see how the um, Q learning, deep Q learning Asian performs uh, with, uh, um, yeah, with a financial environment. Yeah, this is uh, in terms of the basics and the basic framework that I wanted to introduce based on card pool. Find is next. 
that I wanted to introduce today. You have access to the code. You can um, execute the code in Colab, for example, or of course you can download it, uh, install the stuff if you haven't already uh, with PIP or Conda, for example, and can try it yourself. So there will be more on the topic. Don't forget to um, um, yeah, uh, come to our Discord server where there are like uh, almost 24 seven discussions are going on. Group, uh, as it stands right now, has uh, 400 plus members. Uh, also, the Twitter account is worth following because there, for example, you will find uh, announcements for the um, uh, events, not probably mine, maybe for others as well, uh, and some more information. And I will also upload the recording of today's session to a YouTube channel that I recently created with, um, yeah, same handles, quants, um, and I will share the links then to the recording as well. In that sense, let's check. There seem to be no further questions. There is uh, another question. Um, again, there's a question related to finance. Um, I'm not suggesting here all the blue um, features for uh, price action. This is something that we can discuss then in the context. Otherwise, it's here a little bit without relationship. Uh, but let me say one thing in general, you usually are responsible to do your research and saying which features uh, do I consider relevant. And basically, whatever you come up with, which is price related or whatever, for whatever you have data for, you can include in the exercise. So there is really no limit when you say, well, I have something that I use with a standard deep learning classification algorithm. You are probably able to use it uh, in a similar fashion, at least with a reinforcement learning agent there as well. Right? All right. Having said that, uh, we should have the reinforcement learning. It's time for playing games first, uh, finance second. I hope I see you on the Discord server for the discussion and uh, I'm planning roughly to do such a webinar on a weekly basis. So more to come soon. I will update the repo, etc. Um, also happy to hear your feedback. In the meantime, take care. Bye-bye.